Well, thank you. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, Lord, we ask you to guide us in each and everything that we say, do, and think. God, that each would be a pleasant offering to you. Father, I pray that you remove the distractions of the outside world for uh, just a little bit and let us focus on growing nearer to you. I uh, pray, Father, this is an acceptable offering to you. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, a couple of things I want to cover before we get started here. One was to let you know that uh, last Sunday we had a picnic out at our place and we had a great time. Um, I think since it was my house, it was my horseshoes, I should have been allowed to win. But uh, apparently others of you thought <clears throat> that you should win. But uh, And I really stink at that too. And uh, anyway, had a good time, so we're going to do that again uh, soon. And also, I uh, want to remind you, too, that our, I said our last Monday night Bible study would be last Monday night. But uh, because of the holiday, uh, we ended up canceling that. So uh, our last Monday night Bible study of the, the season will be tomorrow night here at 6.30, right here. And it's going to be on Revelation, um, Book of Revelation, so be interesting. Hope you're here. Hope you've had a good week, and we're going to talk today about, and that's why Ron had this song up about that little kid's song about the B-I-B-L-E, because we're going to talk about the Bible this morning, and why we should read it. <clears throat> Several years ago, there was a family that sent their son to the University of Kentucky to study, and before he left, they gave him a brand new Bible, and they told him to read this, that this has a lot of things in it that are going to be very helpful to you as you go through college life and into your adult life. Well, he hadn't been gone but just a few weeks, and he called his parents, and he says, uh, I'm running kind of short on money. Could you send me some money? And they said, well, get your Bible out and read John 3.16. So a couple of days later, they got a letter back from the son saying, I read John 3.16. What about the money? And they wrote him back and said, well, you didn't read the Bible because in John 3.16, we put a $100 bill in there for you when you need it. So they had gone through life, stashing money in the Bible, cut their son in a lie. Well, the Bible may not be full of $100 bills, <clears throat> and in my house it's not, but it is full of a lot of treasures, a lot of interesting things, a lot of things that will value us. But why do Christians, because Christians, we know that, we know the Bible is a good tool, that it's full of a lot of information that we need, but a lot of times we just don't read it. And why is that? Why is it that, that Christians, knowing that the Bible is of value to them, don't take the time to read it? Well, we're going to look at some scripture this morning. We're going to start out with 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. And here's what it says. It says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So even back 2,000 years ago, the apostle Paul told us the Bible is good. It's an important tool for you to use. And they didn't even have the New Testament of the Bible yet. We have that. Paul says uh, about the Bible this way, Paul says that the Bible was given to us by God in writing for us to use. And it was designed to reveal the essence of his relational heart. And for us to really understand how relational God is, we need to study his Bible. And he also wrote it for us, not to only to re, uh, record the history, but to let us know what his plan is for our life. So if we're going to know what happened in the past, we need to read the Bible. If we, we want to know what God has planned for us, we need to read the Bible. And that's a lot of information in it. But we can also look at the Bible a different way in a way that the Bible is a whole library of books that we can take with us anywhere we go. The Bible is written, uh, is actually a, a, an accumulation of 66 books written by 40 different authors, and it covers everything from history. There's war stories in there. There's uh, romance stories in there. There's uh, miracles, and there's much, 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 much more that we need to read. And we can look at the Bible that way uh, that I believe God wants us to. We can look at the Bible, and this is the way I've described it many times, is it's an instruction manual, or it's an operations manual for us so we can better understand ourselves. It can help us out in our everyday life in so many different ways. The Bible is a, a, an accumulation of, 
uh, of uh, love letters. That's the way you want to think about it. It's a love letter written to us. It tells us all about how much he cares for us and how much he has planned for us and how much he uh, loves us and wants for us in our life. So I'm going to ask you this morning uh, a, a brief question. How, how do we get to know God well as Christians? as Christians who are established in their faith, or even those uh, who may not be established in their faith, they're kind of looking at Christianity. How do we really get to the point where we know more about God? Well, a lot of people say, well, you go to church every Sunday, and that somebody will stand up in front of you, usually a dashing-looking guy. Um, <laughs> usually, but not today. Um, but somebody will stand up and he'll tell you about God. And he'll tell you about God's plan for you and what, what he wants for you. Some people will say, well, I have friends that I talk to and I share my faith with. They share their faith with me, and that's how I learn about God. Most people, I think, learn from their parents. Their parents will tell them about God. They'll lay that foundational basis. Uh, and Ken, I know your mom and dad were extremely involved in their church and raised him in the church and raised him under that. But a lot of parents, you know, they're passing down information that they got from their parents who got information from their parents. And it may not be really scriptural, it may not be biblical, but it's just kind of a folklore that we've passed down over the years. But if you're going to learn about God from a preacher or a family member or a friend, and that's the only source of information that you get about him, I've got a secret for you this morning. You're never going to know him. You're never going to truly know God. You're never truly going to know how much God loves you. You're never truly going to know how much, what God has in store for you and what is planning for your life if you're just listening to me. Because I'm never going to be able to make that a relational thing with you. Think of it this way. If I stood up here every week and I told you about my dad, most of you know about my dad, he's a great guy. And if I told you what a wonderful person he was and how much I loved him and, and how if he was here he would love you and how much he would want to do for you and care for you, you would never fall in love with that man the way I have because you don't know him. You've never really sat down and talked to him. You've never studied him. You've only heard what I have to say about him. You would never be able to fall in love with somebody just because of something they've been told. It would be impossible, as a matter of fact, for you to love someone just because I love him. Well, that's what happens here every week. I teach about Jesus. I teach about God and about how much he loves you and the way he's designed a system for us. But it's hard for you to transfer that into a, a personal relationship with yourself unless you get to know him personally. And that's why we want to talk about the Bible this morning. The same thing goes for learning about God as goes for learning about our earthly parents, too. If you truly want to know God on a one-on-one -on -one basis, if you want to know him personally, then you have got to develop a relationship with him individually and personally. When I was uh, becoming a Christian and studying him, I used to talk about Jesus. I said, I want to know that man. I want to know him personally. I want to know how tall he is. I want to know what he smells like. I want to know when I shake his hand what the texture of his hand feels like against mine. I want to know everything about that man. And that's what we do as people. When we meet people, we shake hands, we hug, y'all sniff each other. I know you do. That's what we want to do. So you're never going to be able to hear from somebody outside about those personal things. If you're going to know him on a personal basis, the best way to do it is through the Bible. That's the best way to do it. The Bible is critically important to us if we want to truly live our lives as Christians. This is just a quote from a couple of different of our presidents and what they've had to say about the Bible. The first one comes from George Washington. He said, it is impossible. George Washington said, it is impossible to righteously govern the world without the Bible as your guide, because without it, we would be without God. In other words, what he's saying is, if you want to lead like God and for God, and you don't know him, you're never going to be able to do it, unless first you get into that scripture and you study and you learn. Ronald Reagan said, within the covers of one single book of the Bible are all the answers to all the problems that we face today, if only we would read and believe it. Those are leaders in our countries from different centuries that have looked at the scriptures and said, this is important stuff. Don't let it slip through your fingers. And don't trust someone else to interpret it for you. 
Mike was telling me this morning. He says, he says, I, I listen to what you say. He says, if I, if I, you didn't say this, but I'll paraphrase. If I would catch you saying something that's not the truth, I'll leave here. But what you're saying is the truth. It's scriptural. It's out of the Bible. And Mike knows that because you read the Bible. You know it because you're into it and you've studied it. Well, how many this morning here, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, have a Bible in your house? And I know everybody does. Everybody's got a Bible in their house. Uh, how many people have more than one Bible in the house? You got a bunch of them. I mean, I'm, we got a bunch of Bibles. I'm a, I guess I'm a Bible junkie. I love collecting them. I love different interpretations. I, I just collect Bibles. In America today, 98% of all homes in America have at least one copy of the Bible in their house. <clears throat> When I was uh, uh, going through the ordination process, the, the elders that I was ordained through asked me to <clears throat> do several things. One was to take two college courses, which I got on video and watched, uh, and, and read four books, three of which I'd already read, and the fourth one I had never even heard about. So it was called um, uh, The Faith uh, Once for All. Look at our seminaries, people over here. They're like, I don't know. It. Never heard of it. <clears throat> and it's by Jack Cottrell. It's, it's, it's almost a textbook. And I went to all the pastors at the church uh, that I was on staff with at the time. There was 20, 23 ordained pastors there. And I went into each of their offices and I said, you have that uh, case, uh, uh, the uh, Faith Once for All by Jack Cottrell. And they go, oh yeah, we all have that. And they pull it off the bookshelf. And I'd open up the book and the spine hadn't been cracked on any of them. This was such a thick book. It was such a heavy book. No one that I know of has ever read that. I have used it as a reference tool a couple of different times. But sometimes the Bible is just like that case once for all from Jack Cottrell. It's a book that you have. It's on your bookcase because you know you need it. If you're going to be a preacher, you got to have a Bible. you got to have that Jack Cottrell book. But that uh, Jack Cottrell book is rarely open. And so is it with the Bible in our homes. We have it because we think we need it, we know we need it, but to take the time to really dive in and start studying it is, uh, is not often done. The Bible has been the best-selling book in the world for hundreds of years, and it is the least likely book to be opened and read in the average American home. Isn't that interesting? We all know we have it, but we seldom read it. The fact is, <clears throat> if the Bible was read like it should be, then people would know more than what they do. Like uh, right now, four out of ten people in the United States know who preached the Sermon on the Mount. Only four out of ten. It was Jesus. He was the guy that taught it. But the average Christian doesn't know the answer to that question because they've never really studied the Scriptures. Since the Bible has been the best-selling book in the world year after year, why don't we read it? Well, I have a few reasons for that that I think are valid reasons for an excuse not to read it. Reason number one is that people think that the Bible cannot be trusted. They just think it can't be trusted. It's an old book. It's a dusty old book. It's outdated maybe. Uh, it's been around for thousands of years. The relevance of it has to have waned out over those thousands of years. First of all, the text from the Bible that we have in our homes is almost word for word to the text that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that much of it was written before the birth of Christ. So the Bible that we have today is still as valid as it was thousands of years ago, even some of it that was written before the birth of Christ. It's identical, the Dead Sea Scrolls, to the Bible that we have today. <laughs> Secondly, everything that's written in the Bible is a direct word uh, from God. It's something that's delivered directly to us. Or it is an eyewitness account of something that happened historically. None of the Bible is made up. None of it is fabricated. None of it is uh, put through by some fictitious person that tried to, uh, to, to sell a point to us. It's not hearsay passed down over thousands of years. Even in the manuscript of the New Testament that dates back to the original date. It's accurate to the day based on scrolls and scriptures that are found written thousands of years ago, the original. It still translates exactly the same way. And lastly, out of all the people that have tried to refute the Bible, have tried to study it, I'm going to study this Bible so I can prove that it doesn't, that it's not the truth and it's not accurate. 
Uh, no one has ever proved this uh, fallacy in the Bible. It's never been proven before. No one, as I've pointed out the ex uh, examples before, nobody ever said, well, I was on the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus wasn't there that day. That's not the truth. Nobody ever said that fishes and loaves story about separating that and feeding those 5,000 people. I was there that day. We all went to McDonald's. They didn't have any fish and loaves there. It wasn't the truth. Nobody ever said, uh, I saw Lazarus after he is dead and he was still dead. Jesus didn't raise him from the dead. There's never been a time in history where anybody read any story out of the Bible and said, proved, that's not the truth. Now, there are people that say, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I don't believe that people can walk on water. I don't believe people could be raised from the dead. I don't believe that Jesus was a virgin birth. I just don't believe it. To which I always say, based on what? What do you base that on? And they go, well, I just don't believe it. Okay. Defend it. Well, based on what? I can't defend that. I, it's just something I don't believe. Well, you're making up stuff when there's history written down here. Stick with the history. There's also been a lot of people who have tried to uh, to disprove the Scriptures who have, in fact, come to know the Lord because of it. Uh, I can think of Lee Strobel, for one. He he intended to disprove the Bible. He was a, a writer for the um, Chicago Tribune, and a prolific writer, a very intelligent person, and he wasn't a Christ follower at all. He was going to disprove the Bible. And he started reading it, started studying it, and he started getting involved in it, and he became a Christian, and one of the most powerful, prolific writers in Christendom. There's another guy by the name of Josh McDowell, who's one of the greatest youth leaders in our country, who uh, decided to disprove Christianity as an atheist and ended up becoming a Christian just because he got into the Scriptures and got into that book. Now, the second reason that people don't believe the Bible, that I think, I think people think that it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. There's a lot of stuff in there that I just don't understand. Now, first of all, I would say to you, if you're going to read the Bible, you ought to pray about it first. I believe that you ought to, before you open that Bible up, you ought to just devote a few seconds to prayer. That, God, I know this is a thick book. I know that it's confusing. I know that the, a lot of people are confused by what they read. Father, make it clear to me. Reveal to me what you want me to take away from this. And I believe God is always... Uh, Gracious, and uh, he, he will provide that for you. I know people that have had trouble reading anything. But after prayer, the scriptures have been unfolded to them because they had the intelligence to pray first. So I think that most people say that it doesn't. A lot of people, I think the reason that say the Bible has been confusing to them, have first of all never tried to read it. Second of all, maybe they've tried, but not known how to do it. So they'll grab a Bible, and they'll open it up, and they'll kind of give it one of these things. And then they'll read, and they'll try one sentence, and they'll go like, well, I don't understand that. Well, of course you don't understand it. You don't know what came before it. You don't know what set it up. You don't know what came after it. So that's a, a good way to be kind of turned off because you don't know what you're reading about. If you don't know what happened before and why what happened is happening in, of course you're going to be confused by what you're reading. If someone just randomly opens up the Bible and reads it, it's going to be confusing to me or anyone else. There was a man one time <coughs> who said, uh, Lord, I want to know what your will is for my life. And he was very prayerful about that, but he wasn't wise about how he opened up the Bible. He opened it up, he looked at one scripture, and the scripture said, Judas went and hanged himself. So he's thinking, well, is the Lord telling me I need to go out and hang myself? Is that what he's saying? So he flips through the Bible again, he finds another scripture and points out, and the scripture says, go and do likewise. So he's thinking, I gotta go hang myself, I gotta do this. Finally, it's the third time he tried it one more time, pointed, and the scripture said, what thou do, do quickly. All good scriptures, but they don't make any sense. Why would God tell you to go out and hang yourself, do it quickly? when it's not the truth. <clears throat> to see how God wants the Scriptures to be alive in your life, you have to get involved and you have to read it. God gave us the Bible to help us. He didn't give it to us to co confuse us, although I confess to you there are parts of it that are confusing even after you've studied it for years and years and years. People that go to seminary, they go to Bible college, so they come out and they'll go there so that they can have all the mysteries of the Bible revealed to them. And they come out saying, it's worse now than it was before. Now I know more things to be confused about. But I think that's intentional. 
I think God wants it to be just a little bit mysterious to us and a little bit confusing to us, so it keeps us going back to that Bible trying to unfold it. So it's a lifelong process. But you're never going to understand the Bible by just picking up parts of it and reading without starting and reading chapter and verse all the way through. Another reason Christians don't like to read the Bible is that they believe it's not relevant for us today. That's old stories. And they talk about donkeys and goats and sheep and stuff, and we don't have those here. Some of us do. I had goats. But uh, people will think, well, it's not really relevant. It doesn't talk about the 21st century man and things that are going on in my life and things that I would understand. Well, I would say to anyone that would tell me that, first of all, they've never read the Bible. If they would have read it, they would have found out that it's as relevant today as it was the day it was written. It's still accurate. It's still relevant. It still talks about men. We went to Africa a couple of years ago and met just hundreds and hundreds of people, all the way from Maasai warriors, all the way up to college presidents, doctors. Uh, we, we met the former president of the country of Kenya while we were there. All vast different uh, types of people. And I went there to talk to him about men, men's ministry, and that's kind of where I focused a lot of my ministry on is the men's area. And I asked these people in Africa, uh, primitive people and sophisticated people, what do you struggle with as a man? You know what they said? Alcohol, drugs, uh, pornography, and women. And I went like, wow. See, over in the United States, we struggle with uh, alcohol, pornography, drugs, and women. So it's the exact same thing, no matter where you are in history, no matter what, it's all the same. The Bible is relevant today. It is as relevant today as it was thousands of years ago. Because when you take the time and you read it, and you invest in it, you will find out its purpose. If you read the Bible, you will find out how to treat your parents. It's all in the Bible. All those answers are in the Bible. If you read the Bible, you'll find out what to do with your money. God talks about money more than almost anything. It was important to him. If you want to know how to do it, read the Bible. <clears throat> if you read the Bible, you'll find out how to choose a spouse. If you try to do it on your own, who's failed at that? Uh huh. If you want to know how to uh, pick a friend, if you read the Bible, the Bible will tell you how to do that. If you want to find out how much God loves you, if you want to find that out, you can hear me talk about it until I turn blue. But if you open the scriptures and you read what God has to say about that, I guarantee you he'll reveal to you how much he loves you. You will find out how to live your life and what God has intended for you in your life if you read the scriptures. That's how you learn how tall God is, how big he is, what his hands feel like when you shake it. You learn that personal things about God. So is this relevant? Picking, uh, treating your parents, knowing what to do with money, how to pick out your spouse. Is that relevant today? Of course it's relevant today. So the Bible is relevant. And there's one more thing that I want you to know about the Bible and why we need to read it <clears throat> is because God wants us to. People say that the Bible is a ne the never-changing Word of God. And I think, again, people that say things like that have never read the Bible and don't truly understand it. I think that the Bible is constantly changing. Its message is always the same, but it morphs in you as you read it. I've been sat at tables before with people and I've uh, read a scripture, and, and I'll say, let's talk about the scripture. And one guy will come from this direction, and I'll think, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And then somebody else will pop up and says, well, what about this? I never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. The Bible is, it's the same message, but it will change by individual who's reading it, I believe, if you read it. In short, the Bible is not just informational. It is transformational. If you get into it, you share. Well, I want to share with you a story. It was a converted cannibal. He was on an island in the South Pacific, and he was sitting in the middle of the jungle next to this very large boiling pot sitting next to him, sitting there reading his Bible one afternoon, and an archaeologist uh, approached him and asked him what he was doing. Well, he kind of shrugged his shoulders and says, well, I'm reading my Bible. And he says, well, wh why are you doing that? Don't you know that the modern civilized man has rejected that book as a silly book and not relevant for men today? And there's nothing in it that we're supposed to do. There's nothing in it that's really relevant to us. You shouldn't be wasting your time by reading that Bible. Well, the former cannibal looked at him slowly from head to toe 
and said to him, Sir, maybe you should read that Bible and give thanks to God because if it weren't for that life-changing information inside of that Bible, you'd be in that pot next to me. It's the truth. So do you want to be transformed? I do. I'm, you know, I've come so far in my own life. I'm, I'm just... And Ron has. Oh, geez, he's still got a lot of work to do. But you know, We've all come so far, but I'm not finished yet. I know Ron's not finished. I know Pat's not finished. None of us are finished. We're all in this process of changing and growing closer to God and being more like God. But the only way we're going to do it, I believe, is one, to meet in community, <clears throat> and that we have that time in community where we can share and uh, uh, encourage one another in our walk, but also we need to read. We need to read that Bible. <clears throat> now, the Bible, as I said before, can be confusing at times. And uh, that's why I believe God has made uh, many different versions of the Bible for us so that we can, one will ap appeal to one person, maybe not to the other. So we all have our own different version of the Bible. Now, one th great thing about church is when you have multiple options, you have something to argue about. So a lot of churches just sit around and argue about which Bible is the best Bible. And I think that's just silly. You need to find the Bible that speaks most clearly to you. And maybe what you have to do is you have to read three or four Bibles or five or six or eight or ten different versions of the Bible until you find the one that speaks to you. And maybe what you'll find out is that it's going to be two Bibles that are going to speak to you. Or you're going to need three. I use three. I, I read primarily the NIV, but I also uh, refer back to the King James sometimes if things aren't clear to me. Believe it or not, I go to King James and it's clear. I'm the only person in the world that works. And I also use the message translation. Sometimes they use the New American Standard. For generations, the Bible that we had was the King James Version, or the KJV, it's called. A lot of people do. It's still prominently used in a lot of churches today. I have a wedding coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm talking to the bride uh, about scripture that she wanted in. She says, the only thing I ask, she says, it has to be King James. And I went, okay, okay. It's the only Bible. <laughs> you hear people say that's the original Bible. And uh, it, it's not the original Bible. It's not that old, really, by uh, compared to the original Bible. But uh, if it doesn't speak to you, if it's not clear to you, if it doesn't reveal the, the nature of God to you, I say stay away from it. Find another one that does. Uh, one of the most popular versions of the Bible, the one I use, is the New Living Translate, or, or the uh, New International Version, the NIV. And that's... That kind of speaks to me. That's the one that's kind of the, the one that's in my briefcase that I, I pull out every day. That's the one that is clear to me. Pat, uh, she uses the NLT, the New Living Translation. That's the one that she's kind of, when she uh, ramped up her walk with the Lord, that was the one that was given to her, and she's just dove into it. That's her Bible, and that speaks to her, and she's uh, very comfortable with it. Uh, most scholars, if you're shopping for a Bible, most scholars think the New American Standard Bible is probably the most accurate translation from the original text. And it's very easy to read. I don't know why it's uh, not probably more popular than it is, but it's called the NASB. Another Bible that's out there that uh, has a lot of controversy around it is called the Message. Um, and it's a translation. It's not a version of the Bible. It's a paraphrase of the Bible, if you want to think of it that way. It's a Bible that's written to be uh, very clearly understood in today's language, and it kind of breaks things down uh, for us that we can understand it. You'll find it a lot of times in uh, uh, youth groups. People read the message translation because it's just a real homespun type language to read. Uh, but know this. I don't think that it makes much difference uh, which Bible you read short of these brief three reasons. Don't for a minute to think that your version of the Bible is the only version of the Bible or that it's the best version of the Bible or it's the real version of the Bible. I think that's just something that causes us to argue with each other about. You may have your favorite that speaks clearly to you, but for you to proclaim to the world that it's the only true Bible, I think that's kind of arrogant of you. So I say don't do that. Find the Bible that you like, that reads the easiest to you. Um, and if you don't know if, if it was, is a good version, you know, see me, see Mike, see somebody, and we'll talk to you about it. We'll, we'll make sure that it is. Two, don't always just use one version of the Bible. I think that's a mistake, too. I think sometimes we uh, will read something in the NIV. And as you read through it, you'll think, well, that's not really clear to me, but that's my Bible. 
So I guess I'm never going to know it. And you just go on. Well, there's other versions out there that may be worded differently, maybe worded much differently or uh, small uh, ways, but do, do read a different Bible. There's, there's uh, Bibles out there that are called parallel Bibles that'll have two different Bibles in them. Is, you, is that what you have here? here? He's got a parallel Bible. Okay. And as he opens up one page, what do, what do you have? Which is parallel? NIV in the message. That, that's a cool Bible. So as he opens up his Bible, on one column will be the NIV and the other column will be the message. So if, if you kind of struggle with language there or something, that's, a, that's an excellent. It's one of my favorite uh, Bibles. As a matter of fact, I, I had one and the guy wanted it so bad I gave it to him. And I know that act of kindness got me into heaven because I really didn't want to give that Bible out. It was such a neat Bible. I'm teasing, of course. But uh, don't just read one uh, version of the Bible. Um, sometimes when I'm preparing, uh, before I uh, get more sophisticated with uh, computers, I would have Bibles laid out all over a desk, you know, reading out of each different one, a different way of things were worded would make things clear to me, or maybe more poetic, or uh, I like the language better. So don't use just one version of the Bible. And then third, pick a favorite and stick with it. Not, not that you have to do that for life, but pick a book and go through it. Read that book and uh, so you can get used to the way the people that wrote that Bible have interpreted it from the original scriptures. So you get used to their style and their way, and it will become clearer to you that way. God gave Bibles to us to use. That's why he gave them to us. There are people around this world today <clears throat> in China that will travel for days to see a Bible, just to see it. They've heard about it, but they've never seen one. And if somebody's got one, they may have to hide it from the government not to be seen. But if somebody comes up and finds out about it, they'll be like, look, that's it. I mean, that's it's that kind of a treat for those who don't have it. But we live in such abundance that uh, we have them everywhere. Uh, my office at home, I, I bet I've got 40 Bibles here. So if you need need one, come see me. I'll be glad to help you out. We'll look at some examples, too, about the Scripture. And going back to this uh, the Scripture that we talked about earlier, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, uh, 17, this is how it's written in King James, the KJV. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect uh, thoroughly finished unto all good works. Now what he's saying there is very clear. The scripture is given by the inspiration of God. God inspired the writing of the Bible. That's where it comes from. And it's profitable, it's valued to us for doctrine, to teach us what the doctrine is, for reproof, for proving what it is, for correction, for instructions, and in righteousness. In other words, to teach, to correct, uh, and to encourage that's what it's written for. That the man of God may be perfect. In other words, us can be more like God in what we know based on the scriptures, uh, thoroughly finished into all good works so that we can go out into the world and do the things that God wants us to do. That's what it says in King James. Clear? Sure. Good to go, Pastor. Keep going. NIV, same exact scripture. This is what the NIV says. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's the exact same thing. Different words, different language, but it's the same thing. All scripture is God-breathed. God inspired it. He spoke it. It is useful for teaching. Teaching like I'm teaching right now. For rebuking, in other words, correcting and saying, whoa, whoa that doesn't honor God in the way you're doing it. Uh, for correcting, training, and righteousness. In other words, it always has to be done for the right motivation and righteousness so that the servants of God, us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we know what we're doing when we go out into the field. New American Standard Bible, the NASB, same scripture. This is what it says. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training, and righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It's the exact same thing. Worded a little bit differently, but it's the exact same thing. And then the message is uh, the final one that we talked about here. And as I said, it's a paraphrase. It's not, a, um, it's not going back to the original text and trying to mirror the words as exactly as possible. It's a paraphrase. Don't let it phase you. That's what the message says. Stick with what you learned and believed, sure of the integrity of your teachers. 
why you took uh, in the sacred scriptures with your mother's milk. There is nothing like written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Every part of the scripture is God-breathed and is useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are to put together and shape up for the task God has for us. In other words, he's saying, don't, don't let all this information phase you. Don't let it stun you. Stick with what you've learned. Stick with what you believe. That's what's important. And being sure of your integrity. Like Mike was saying to me earlier, he says, you ever say something wrong, you don't interpret the scriptures right, I'm out of here. And that's exactly what you ought to do. That's what the scriptures said. And it talks about taking that with your mother's milk. In other words, when you were an infant, when you were little, your mother provided this for you. So you have a teacher that provides stuff for you. And that's a good thing. But at some point, go back to that written word of God, showing the way to salvation through your faith in Jesus Christ. Every part of the scripture is God-breathed. <clears throat> it's useful one way or the other, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. That's what the scriptures are for. It's the exact same story. It doesn't matter which version that you want to read, which one is the most comfortable to you. And maybe you've got a pick up three or four different Bibles or, or, or find a, a scripture and maybe it'll be the 23rd Psalm or John 3.16 or something. If you're learning about this, those are scriptures that you may know have committed to memory as a poem or something that you've heard so often in church. Then go to several different uh, versions of the Bible and go through and read them differently and see how it's worded and see which one impacts you. All Bibles, I believe, for the most part, are written with the same purpose and the same intent and for the same and, and can have the same value to us if we use them. The important thing is read your Bible. You will never, you will never have a personal relationship with Jesus until you do it. And if you think you've got that relationship now, man, you just cracked the door. If you want to really get to know him, if you really want to know, get to know the Father in heaven, Read your Bible, and it'll tell you. Let's pray, and then we'll uh, get on with our day. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, first of all, for the scriptures that you've given us. Lord, I uh, thank you for um, placing the desire to write and record history and all these wonderful, rich stories uh, in the hearts of uh, people throughout history. Father, so many of them given their life uh, to record these stories for us, so Father, I ask you for uh, forgiveness for those of us who don't uh, take the time to appreciate the sacrifice that others have made for us or to appreciate uh, you and what you've done for us by providing this book. So God, I pray that you place a desire in the hearts of each and every person in this room today that uh, at some point this day we pick up those books and we start in Genesis 1.1. And it says there, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a wonderful place to start. Start right there, Father, and go right through that book of Genesis. Uh, slowly, surely, I pray that we are drawn to our knees in prayer before we open the books of the Bible. And, Father, that you reveal to each one of us exactly what you would have us take away from that. And, Father, I'm going to thank you for what you're about to do. Because I know you are good and you are holy and you want only what is good for us. So, uh, Father, I, I have no doubts at all that you'll do this. Thank you, Lord, for that. I pray, Father, that you are with uh, those of us in the church that are out traveling today about other things, that you bring them back to us safely next week. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ever feel left out? Ever feel like you just don't understand or that nobody understands you? You ever feel like nobody cares? Come climb the mountain. It's nothing like you've ever seen. Our philosophy is simple. Love God, love people. The Mountain Community and Christian Learning Center. It's faith, it's family, and it's friends. Stroll in, grab a donut, some coffee, and grab a seat. Enjoy the company of a warm, welcoming family of Christ followers as we encourage, support, and worship together. No Sunday's best here. Simply come as you are. Come as your own Father would have you. On Sundays, 9 a.m. is Happy Hour Fellowship with a message from Pastor Brad Allred or a guest speaker starting at 10. If you're looking for a church family or simply looking for a change, stop by and visit. We'd love to have you.